Listen, do you ever feel like you're struggling to get the big projects done? Maybe you're feeling good, but you feel like others are just getting ahead of you and doing things faster. Or even worse, maybe you show up, you sit in front of your computer, and you just blank out and you're not getting anywhere. Listen, this is going to be the session for you because you could be suffering from low P. And listen, low P is something that hit me as a graduate student, hits almost everybody at some point in their career. And the sooner you get out in front of this, the sooner you are going to unlock your peak productivity. This is something valuable that you now have the opportunity to work on. And what we're gonna do today is I'm gonna take a data-driven scientific approach to help you unlock your productivity. And what we're gonna do, much like a doctor, we are forensically gonna dig deeper to understand the root causes, the causes of the causes of your symptoms of low P. So stick with me. Again, I'm Professor David Stuckler, and I had a lot of trouble as a graduate student. I nearly flunked out when I was at Yale, and it was only when I mastered some of these tips that I really started to fly. I've then, as a professor, passed these on to my students at Harvard, Oxford, and Cambridge over the years, but with this community that I've created, Fast Track Grad, I wanna open up these secrets to everybody. So it's not just the preserve of the few, but truly democratizing higher education. Join my Facebook group, by the way, we can communicate directly there and you'll get many more live tips. So let's dive straight in. I've pulled up here in the background a whiteboard. And what I've labeled here are some of the most common symptoms or signs that you may have low P. You may recognize one, you may recognize all of these symptoms, um, but for each of them, we need to go a bit deeper. Now, uh, one thing I wanna point out that, that's really important here is that I kind of divide the signs and symptoms of low P into two broad categories. One kind of below this dashed line I made here are the technical aspects. That, and these are things that are coming up. You feel stuck writing, or you just don't know what to do. Uh, both of these are very common. I don't know how to analyze my data. I don't know how to do a multivariate regression. And we've got a lot of training, and we're gonna talk about these. Um, but what so commonly happens with these, especially if you've been living in this world as a cause of low P for a while, is that this, over time, this technical aspect starts to become mental. It starts to get in your head, and it starts to provoke other symptoms like procrastination, crash and burn cycles, leading potentially even to burnout, where sadly, one in three students who embark on the journey uh, of a research path as a master's or PhD student, one in three don't finish. And that's not because they didn't want to, but because they were really suffering from low P. And I don't want that to happen to you. So here we've got on the mental side, things can happen. You can feel a lack of time, you just don't have enough time, or you're not really multitasking very well. You've got many things going on in your life. Maybe you have children, maybe you have a job, and you're just not balancing them very well and you need to get better at that. The other is that you feel like you just sit down and you get distracted. Maybe your mind wanders, you start thinking about other things you gotta do, you get up, you make a sandwich, you go put clothes in the laundry. Listen, I have had all of these things happen to me. So let's take them one by one and go deeper. And I need you to be honest with yourself. Really be honest. Which of these are affecting you right now? Right now. And, and we're, we're gonna work on it together. And it, it's a process. And this is something that is gonna happen. If it's happening to you now, it can very well happen. We have big projects in the future. And when you have heavy deadlines and things that are really pushing you and stretching you in the way that uh, grad school and research commonly does. So let's deal with the first, stuck writing. This is probably, I, I have to say, I, I hear the most, these are the two I hear the most. Let's dig deeper in the roots. So if you're stuck writing, in general, one of two things are going on. One is you simply don't know how to write. And listen, I can't fault you for that because I was never taught how to write. And I routinely canvas and survey my grad students. It's something I like to ask on the first day. How many of you have gotten writing, writing training? Raise your hand. And it's maybe one or two. And like, yeah, maybe I got something back in, in high school, secondary school, uh, don't really remember a whole lot. And, and the tragedy is we just don't teach how to write. But <laughs> there's a simple fix. And we've developed and adapted a 
peer system that makes writing smooth and easy. I've, I've clicked a link to that video below. All right, I won't be able to go in much detail, but I can point you to the right resources here that are gonna help. So if you don't know how to write, this peer system is gonna give you that missing training, that gap in, in your own formation that you really need and have been missing. Second, and more common, is you're just not ready to write. I see so many students who are effectively vomiting on a page and then trying to clean it up, find some structure, make sense of things, and kind of figure it out through writing. And you need to take a step back from that and first have crystal clear clarity on what you want to say. If you don't know what you want to say, you have no business writing. Now, you could say to yourself, yeah, I am intentionally taking this strategy of just going Bleh, and then trying to make sense of it. And that is that is one approach. It's not the ideal approach that I recommend because it does lead to going into circles, writing, rewriting, and just getting nowhere. I suggest to write, we have a principle of writing from the inside out. And this gets you in that cycle of taking a first step, feeling confident, and then moving forward. By inside out, what I mean is write the paper in a way that's more natural, that follows the flow of what you actually did. So that means don't start with the introduction, which is the hardest to write. Don't start with the conclusion, also terribly difficult to write. Start with the methods. You know what you did. And all you have to do in the methods is explain it to others in a very simple, clear-cut way. Start with the methods, then move to the results. And to know what you wanna say, I often have my students create something I call a result set, which is basically telling the story of your paper in tables, figures, or whatever data that you have, could be quotes from your interviews, and lining that up. And that creates a very clear, coherent structure so that when you're writing, you know where you're taking your reader by the hand, where they're going to end up. But if not, you you could really be taking your reader on kind of a wild goose chase that ends nowhere clear. Okay, now these things I, I said left unaddressed for a lot of time can turn into more uh, mental areas. So make sure you get these writing issues dealt with immediately and we've got great resources to help you. Second is you just don't know what to do. This is more a, a classic technical skill. I don't have the skill set to run a multivariate regression. I don't know how to operationalize this in R or state or SPSS, whatever I'm using, or I don't know how to do this Western blot in the lab. The solution here is relatively clear and obvious. You need to go get the right support and sometimes this can cause more confusion. You don't know multivariate regression and you start hunting around on YouTube and you have 20 different ways of having it taught to you and you feel even more lost and confused and then you start to believe that you just can't do it. And we need to prevent that from happening. So you need trusted sources, high quality sources, not Joe Schmo who hasn't published a paper in their life on the internet. Um, you need to go get the right support. The other thing here is you need mentors. And this is a critical time for most of you where you do have the time to invest in your training and your resources. I remember when I was a grad student, I was too scared to say I didn't understand something. And I think it's one of the big things that's changed for me as a professor now, as I've gotten more confident in myself, and I can feel my feet planted on the ground, is I can say, I don't understand. I don't know. Can you explain that to me? And I wish I would have had the confidence earlier to do that because it would have saved me so much frustration. But you do need to seek help. It's common that you're not gonna know how to do something. That is exactly why you're embarking on this journey. You do have to remember, what got you here will not get you there. And so many of you, you were at the top of your class. You were the best and the brightest, and that's where you are now. And you're where you are now because you were judged and deemed worthy of being there. Don't forget that. Don't slip into imposter syndrome. If you do feel imposter syndrome, if you do feel a bit like a fraud, a great training for that too, link below. Um, but remember this, what got you here won't get you there and you are going to need new training and acquire new skills and resources to help you break through that plateau and get to the next level. Okay, this this leads to, to the next aspect and, and again, often I think many of you will be watching this and realize, ah, uh, yeah, a lot of these things resonate with me too. So let's go through them one by one. Uh, a very common one is this one, lack of time. And a lack of time can be simply because you don't have enough time. In which case, you do need to question, do you have enough time to invest in this in your life right now to do this well and do this properly? Because if you don't, you're, you're setting yourself up for defeat, for frustration, 
For example, I work with a lot of students and we have a timeline to say, right, if you dump in five to 10 hours per week of work with the right training, with the right support, within three months, we can get you a publication, high impact publishable paper. I had one student, a, a doctor who said, well, really busy in the clinic, I can only do one to two hours a week. Well, instead of putting in that time, investment, energy, the output out took, instead of three months, took six months. So uh, you have to calibrate your expectations based on the amount of time you have. That said, in probing deeper and working with many students over the years, I found there's actually a lot of inefficiencies in the way that time is distributed and allocated. And the way you have to deal with this is through a time diary. Think about it for a second. I've got a, a really close friend from the state of Texas, where I'm originally from, and he is, uh, unfortunately, had been struggling for a long time with his weight, he's morbidly obese. And the first thing you need as a scientist in this is to kind of understand where you're at, what your situation is. So the first thing I pushed him to do was, hey, you need to get an app like MyFitnessPal and you need to start counting your calories. We need to have the data on what's going wrong and where in what you're eating. And just by doing that, he came back to me and said, wow, you know, I've, I've actually, without doing anything, just by tracking myself, I realized I had all these snacks and other things that were slipping in. I didn't even realize how many calories I was getting from them. I've been able to eliminate those. And just by tracking has made me really highly motivated to improve my habits. So just the fact of tracking that cliche, what me gets measured gets done, makes a huge difference. So I recommend all of you take an exercise for a week if you have a lack of time and keep a time diary. Keep a time diary. It, I, know, you, I don't even have time to keep a time diary. No, it's not hard. There's apps, there's an Excel sheet. I'll put a link below. You just track it. You need this data. You need this data to uh, take a critical look at yourself and your habits. And what you will often find is you will find dead spaces that you can reactivate. That might be during a commute, you can listen to a literature review, you can uh, uh, read articles, you can do other things. Um, the other thing you might find is you haven't blocked off time. You haven't blocked off time of one and a half hours to two hour chunks that is dedicated for your research. Because research, you can't do in five, 10 minutes. You can't duck in and out. You need an unbroken time. And really this kind of deep productivity that's really pushing you to your limits, and it really is, right? If it were easy, everybody could do it, um, right? You, you have to look at your day, map it out, and, and find where those spaces are and protect them vigorously. This is like your training. Right? A lot of our training is pushing us to watch a YouTube short, quick video, get quick hits on Instagram, and instead, what research calls for, especially at the beginning, as you're acquiring new skills, putting many new things into practice right, for the first time, is that unbroken concentration. And our whole world is engineering us not to be able to do that. This is a mental muscle you've got to train. So you need these time blocks. The other thing the time diary gets you to is, and helps you implement an XDA model. If you don't have enough time, there may be things you can cut, things you can delegate, or things you can automate. And this can also win back your time. And by having that data on your time, I, I've found with many students, those who are working, they might even hire a virtual assistant to take care of their emails. They might be able to delegate things to other people. And in other cases, cut, because this is not the most important thing that they're doing right now. Uh, some of the tasks in their schedule, cut those and really focus on what's core and central rather than just be in a reactive triage mode, constantly fighting fires. Okay, lack of time. So all is not lost. Right, but you take a critical look and try that time diary out. Second, multitasking. Man, I get so many people say, look, I just need to get better at multitasking. In my life, I'm busy, I have so many things going on, and I'm just not good at it. You're never gonna be good at it. Nobody's good at multitasking. We're not engineered to be that way. I don't know anybody who's gotten super highly successful as a researcher by saying, yep, thanks, it's, uh, I won my Nobel Prize, and it's all because I was fantastic at multitasking, says nobody. So forget this. Instead, what you need to do is optimize one. I'm a big believer in this, big fan of this. Find what that one most important thing for you right now is and that you need to do to get to the next level and make that your focus. And when you make that your focus, I recommend generally doing it as the first block of your day, that block that you're gonna find from your time diary. And sometimes called the idea is kill the frog or eat the frog. Take that on first. 
when you're the freshest, the brightest, you have the most energy, it might be the most painful thing, but that's what you need to dive into and optimize. So if you haven't defined your one, you need to get clarity on that. Let that be your North Star and attack it first thing in your first time block of the day. Finally, this is sort of the, the worst scenario because by the time you're getting distracted, things have kind of slipped on for a while. And what I commonly see happen is these are early warning signs of a burnout. So when people tell me, you know what, I'm just not, I used to love my topic, I, I just lost interest. I just lost enthusiasm, I, I don't wanna do it anymore. And, and the issue is you haven't really protected your passion. And this could be because, right, you, you, you loved it, but now it's full of these associations of negativity. Oh, I didn't know what to do. Now this thing that I loved, every time I think about it, it, it brings me, oh, I feel it in my chest, like I can't breathe, I'm frustrated. And that's really sad because many of you are going down this path because you want to make a difference in the world. You want to do something good to bend the arc of history in, in a favorable way. And that passion has just become completely deflated and lost. And instead of being passionate, the opposite. It's You feel antagonized by your passion. You really need to protect this passion. And, and oftentimes, people here have slipped into a burnout where they're withdrawing from their friends, their families. They feel ashamed to even talk to anybody about where they're at. And the reality is often if you've gotten to this point, it may be too late and you may need to complete this burnout cycle, let it take its course, and then restart and restart in the right way not get in cycles of productivity and then crash, productivity then then crash. That that often happens when people wait to the last minute, wait for adrenaline to kick in, and then kind of half-baked get things done. Um, so you need to protect this from happening and act sooner. There, there are a few things that can also happen though. If you just simply get distracted because you haven't trained your mental muscles to be indistractable, and that's very common because that, again, like I said a moment ago, that goes against our nature and the reality of the social media world that we live in. So in general, I find pre-commitment is stronger than willpower. So what do I mean? You know, coming back to my buddy who was trying to lose weight, he found that, hey, there are certain chocolate bar snacks that he really loves. Your two options are you could put these very up far up high on a shelf so that you can't access them or make it hard to access, that's pre-commitment. The second willpower is maybe the chocolate bar is right there in front of you and you are gonna stop yourself from the temptation of eating it. In general, pre-commitment works better. So how do, what does that mean for you? It means if you know you're gonna get distracted and start checking Instagram or Twitter or something else, lock your phone out. There are apps that can lock you out so that you can't even open them up. Or just put your phone in another room, which is what I do. My phone is always on silent, far away from me when I'm trying to work so I can be indistractable. I don't have to rely on my willpower to do it. Why? Because when things get hard, our mind tricks us. It tells us anything we wanna hear to be more comfortable and at ease. It's like, ah, maybe I'm a little hungry. I'll focus better if I go make a sandwich. All these things will start to get in your head and willpower, for many of you, at least for me, will fail. Pre-commit yourself when you get in a space in a time block that you are protecting your work to not be distracted by making your environment indistractable. And by making your environment indistractable, in so doing, you're gonna make yourself less easily distracted. Finally, I do wanna encourage you to think about this as mental training. If you think about it, if you're training for the Olympics, you're training for peak performance. And that is not something that comes overnight. You wouldn't expect somebody to be able to run a marathon without running first maybe a five kilometer run and then a 10 kilometer run. It's the same thing here. Now give yourself a little grace. This is something you may not have done before. You may not have had projects this big on this type of a scale. So uh, you need to ensure you go into this mental training prepared and treat yourself as though you're a mental athlete. And if you do that, you are going to start getting great results, slowly but surely improving. Steady, steady, slow progress. This is not something I've seen working with students that changes like this to this overnight. It's a process. But over time, you will get to the point that you can kind of step into the zone at will. And that's like having a superpower for your productivity. Listen, uh, we've covered a lot. Inevitably, I've only scratched the surface. This is one of those areas that we need to talk about more as researchers and we just don't do enough. But I guarantee you, start this journey, take the scientific approach, map out your time, 
build up the time diary, and you will get yourself unlocked to the next level and fight this scourge of low P. Don't forget to join my Facebook group. We can be directly in touch in the DMs. And if you let me know what you've been struggling with, I can connect you to the right training just for you. Look forward to seeing you all in the next video.